Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'll be the host of the meeting this morning. Okay, hopefully this work a bit better. There we go. Just a compliance and disclaimer. Um, as I said, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. And I welcome you again to this morning's meeting. Sorry about the little technical glitch we had there at the start. For any people who hasn't joined one of our previous meetings, um, these happen every fortnight over the course of an hour. We have two companies on who have a 30 minute slot each with a 20 minute prezzo and a 10 minute Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, please type the questions into the Q&A box and then I will moderate the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Just please be aware that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel in due course um, which is also very helpful if you want to go back and re-watch the presentations if um, a presenter happens to go over a slide a little bit too quickly or you want to uh, double check something. Um, if you're not following us already on Twitter, please do follow us on Coffee Microcaps. Please also follow the YouTube channel for this recording, all previous recordings, and any future uh, meetings that we're going to have. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn where I post some additional long form content in relation to microcap investing. Our two panelists uh, this morning, first up, we're going to hear from XTech Limited. That will be followed up by Pay Group Limited. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now, and I'm going to hand over to Mr. Philippe Boudouard from XTech. Philippe, if you want to get your screen up and then I will let you know once we can uh, see the first slide of your presentation. Any success? Uh, yep, yeah. yeah, I can see the first slide of your presentation now, Philippe. You start in, yeah, okay. Is that a slide? Is that a slide? Yeah, okay, that's a slide show. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, and thank you for joining us on the uh, Coffee Microcaps. Um, XTech is a uh, is a very interesting company. We operate in a, in an area that is uh, a bit different from a lot of uh, small caps. Uh, we we operate in defence, uh, but defence is a is a very very topical. It's a uh, very much of a uh, a way to sort of um, um, uh, preserve your uh, preserve your investment on on one side when things are not going that well, but also uh, XTech has had uh, incredible success in the past uh, in the past few weeks, which I'm I'm going to go through, uh, which is you know making it an extremely attractive um, um, share to sort of uh, own. So our purpose is basically protect the fault line protector. Um, the concept is. Uh, we mainly operate in uh, in the area of you know uh, protection and and uh, equipment for the uh, for the soldier. So um, that's a, a very um, um, an area where technology is only starting to appear. So it's uh, it's actually you know very exciting in terms of uh, that space. Investment highlight: uh, we're very well positioned for growth, uh, which is underpinned by uh, accelerated commercialization of the high value proprietary solutions that we, uh, we've designed and a very favorable market sentiment in, within domestic and global um, defense industry. So uh, we're working in a uh, defense market with, uh, which is uh, you know, very favorable. Um, on, in Australia in particular, there is a very strong push for local solutions and we're part of that sort of a, uh, environment. We've focused on market leading soldier solutions. So we, we have uh, all our solutions are very advanced in, in terms of technology. They're always at the forefront, whether it's things that we bring from overseas or things that we develop ourselves. Uh, we, accelerated, we have accelerated uh, ballistic solution strategy. Uh, we are uh, very strong in, in research and, and, uh, and now commercialization of uh, very, very exciting new ballistic solutions, helmet and, and plates. Uh, but we also positioned in the um, uh, in drones and uh, actionable intelligence solution, uh, which is another very exciting area. 
and we have a very strong growth and, and, um, and outlook. So corporate overview, uh, the share price around 65 cents, uh, market cap of about 35 million. Uh, we had a net cash of 4 million in the bank uh, as of the 31st of December. Um, our board is um, quite small, our non-executive non chairman is also the, the biggest shareholder. He has about 10% of the, of the shares. Uh, I am the managing director, I've got some, quite a few shares too. Uh, we have uh, Ivan Slavich and, um, and Chris Fullerton as non-executive directors as well, and, and Rob, Bob Codling as a executive director is uh, my uh, uh, chief operating officer. Uh, as you can see, the uh, share price has, has uh, not uh, suffered too much from the, uh, from the recent issues in the uh, coronavirus. And, um, you know, we've um, been uh, operating, you know, the whole time and uh, without, you know, any change in terms of the orders or, or, or affected in any way by health, neither here in Australia nor in our uh, subsidiary in the, in the U.S. The market is an extremely favorable market. Um, the, um, you can see that um, in, in Australia, the um, defense budget is around $39 billion with a growth rate of about 7%. But of course, if you want to operate in this and you have good solutions, uh, you can see that the, uh, the US and the, um, and the European markets are really making, um, making a huge difference. I mean, you know, uh, Europe is uh, eight times as big as Australia. Um, um, USA is about 20 times as big. Uh, and all of them in, uh, in substantial growth. So um, if we want to sort of uh, grow in that particular area and you have your own products, of course, uh, Europe and USA are a prime target. So what we do, um, very simply, um, we do a number of um, products um, related to ballistic shields and, uh, and platform armor. We do helmets, uh, soft armor, hard armor, uh, we have some activities as well in, in sort of uh, um, sniper rifles and, uh, and other, other, other rifles. So that's the protection of the, uh, of the soldier. Uh, the other act activity that we have that is extremely, um, uh, works extremely well is um, our drones. They, we're talking about small drones that you can launch by hand, weighing between 1.5 to, to 5 kilos. Uh, and uh, progress in that area has been you know, pretty massive and we'll see that in a, in a moment. What we do is we, uh, we resell some, uh, some of these um, um, uh, drones from the US, uh, but we actually have developed a, uh, a very strong uh, piece of software that interfaces uh, the data coming and the pictures coming from those drones to um, uh, other systems that uh, exploit them. And uh, we, we do a lot of uh, data presentation and data processing of, uh, of these pictures. We'll see that in a moment as well. And we do a number of other uh, soldier solutions that uh, we're not going to uh, talk too much about today. So our strategy, focusing on commercializing our world-class soldier solutions in key targets markets uh, globally. So uh, we are very focused in terms of our own technology and selling it worldwide. And that's, uh, that's very important. We have a clear pathway to global markets, you know, which is where the growth is and where the quantities are. Uh, we're very focused on high value soldier solutions. So um, you may think that a drone is quite different from a protection. Uh, the kinds of people now that are using our equipment or buying our equipment are pretty much the same. Um, and we have a, a significant experience and expertise within the organization. We have a, a number of ex-military. Uh, uh, we have extremely good scientists as well as um, you know, extremely good uh, uh, international um, background and, and, and expertise, which is very important to be able to address uh, international markets. So probably the, the key of what we're doing is, uh, is in that slide and we'll spend a few, a few minutes on it. Um, we, we have done a lot of work in, in terms of ballistics. Uh, we have now a unique world best helmet and plates ready to be delivered. Uh, like any new innovation, um, you know, it's not good enough to, good, to have a good R&D. Uh, you need to, to have a number of other um, um, things that make it uh, valuable and therefore uh, capable of being sold and therefore making money for the company and, uh, and, and money for our shareholders. First thing that you need is a groundbreaking technology and we have that called Exclav. It's patented. It's a composite curing consolidation technology which enables to manufacture lighter, stronger and stiffer 
uh, composite articles. Uh, you can see here um, a picture of myself actually and, and our chairman in front of the, uh, the machine in question uh, when we had the uh, official opening of the, of the factory in, um, uh, in Adelaide in, uh, in February. So uh, we produce uh, that technology we've been working on for about 10 years or so. And it's now, you know, uh, fully uh, validated. Um, it actually produces light, very light ballistic um, uh, armor. Uh, helmets in particular, but plates as well, and it's completely uh, world unique. This, no one does anything like this. No one come anywhere near what we do. So, great technology to start with. Um, it wouldn't be good enough if you could couldn't produce. You know, having a a lab that can produce one helmet a uh, a day doesn't help you uh, greatly in terms of making money. So the the, the next thing we did we. Uh, uh, sized up the uh, the exclave and the different uh, machinery that is needed to make those kinds of products and we set it up in a manufacturing center in adelaide that we opened up in uh, in february of this year you can see here uh, the minister for uh, uh for industry in uh, south australia you know doing the opening uh, in february so it's it provides commercial scaling of the of the manufacturing and um you know we we have started manufacturing uh, already in there uh, have a technology and a manufacturing plant is great, but you need products. And so we've designed a number of products that are using technology and that um, 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 we are, we've launched um, uh, recently. Uh, plates, you can see some pictures of that. Uh, helmets, you can see the, the helmet that we, are, we have designed and, and are producing. Um, it's very lightweight, uh, very high quality. Uh, we launched a, um, a number of these products uh, in uh, January at a, uh, an exhibition in, in the US and the, the feedback that we've had uh, on those is, is extremely good. We've had a, a number of uh, tests that have been done with a number of uh, our distributors in the US and they're all coming you know, back extremely positive, very light, uh, extremely efficient against uh, different, different rounds. And uh, of course, last but not least, if you have the product, the manufacturing capability, the technology, you need orders. Um, and that's a, a lot of startups are, um, are basically stumbling, not, not necessarily on the technology, but on, on those last three uh, items. So we got our first domestic order a, few, a couple of months ago. It's already delivered. Uh, we got our first international order, order that we, um, um, we won on a uh, international competition. Uh, we received a, uh, that order just about three weeks ago. It was announced at that time. Uh, it's with the Finnish army, you know, people that have, uh, you know, uh, um, very uh, turbulent uh, neighbors. And so uh, they're very, very uh, active and, and concerned about, you know, their, their own safety. So um, that is people that are, you know, very advanced as well. And, you know, um, are played, you know, one hands down against, uh, against all the competition here. Uh, we have a number of negotiations uh, happening at the present time with potential customers um, underpinned by, you know, very well established network networks. So you can see that now we, we are starting to produce, we're starting to sort of deliver and uh, something that is completely unique and completely, um, um, you know, valid uh, at, in, not only in Australia, but also worldwide. So how do we sort of enhance the way we, uh, we can sell in that market? Well, one of the first thing uh, that we've done now nine months ago was to sort of uh, get get going into uh, into the U.S. The U.S., as I mentioned to you, is actually the biggest market in in the world for these kinds of things. We acquired a company that is making uh, ballistic armor uh, in there in uh, in um, Columbus, Ohio. Um, it's already profitable. Uh, the whole um, acquisition was uh, uh, was actually um, um, accretive. Um, and so we've retained the uh, very experienced U.S. management that uh, uh, was coming with the business. And we got access to U.S. networks um, um, for our new products through that, that organization. Um, and with them, we sort of presented uh, that product pipeline into, uh, into SHOT Show, as I mentioned in, in a, few, a few minutes ago, as a, at, at, which is the biggest uh, um, exhibition in, uh, in the North America for these kinds of, uh, these kinds of products. So, you know, having a, a, a physical presence with a, uh, uh, in the biggest market in the world is, is essential. And the integration of that company has gone extremely well. Uh, I think it is, it is a, uh, a, you know, a, great, a great success coming up. 
So, as you can see, the commercialization strategy is very clear for us. Uh, we had to sort of go, uh, do our manufacturing capability and integrate our US business. So we've developed the technology, we validated the technology, we opened up our new manufacturing center. We started the international and domestic commercial orders, so we have those in, in hand. Uh, we leverage our US network for um, exclave exports and uh, we're targeting large global orders. Uh, so those last two, last two uh, boxes are basically happening as we speak. Uh, coming on, on a few of the other products, um, Xatlas, I mentioned, is a, uh, is a piece of software, that uh, an application that allows rapid production of real-time, accurate georeference 3D mapping from video feed from a, a UAV. Um, that allows you to compare that with previous data, which ensures an instant situational awareness and targeting. Um, imagine how what you can do by creating a, a real-time uh, 3D map from a, uh, a 1.5 kilo um, 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 drone. It's it's quite unique. You, you know, you you have the capability of the very large uh, drones. Uh, for a, a, a very small fraction of the cost. So that actually will completely, you know, revolutionize the way uh, people are, are managing the battlefield um, using those small drones and, and, and doing, getting instant situational awareness and anything that has changed compared to five minutes, 10 minutes ago, which is critical to the, uh, the, soft, the, the soldier's safety. Can be retrofitted to existing hardware. We've been pushing that not only in Australia, we've sell, sold quite a few to Australia, sold quite a few in New Zealand, and uh, we're looking at several others in, uh, in the rest of the world. Um, that goes together with uh, the, the drone sales that, we, uh, that we're doing. Um, remember, that is a very important uh, um, uh, aspect of, uh, of what we do, selling drones, and we've been very successful on that. Other products that we, uh, we're looking at, uh, we, we are quite successful in the space area. We have a, a strong relationship with the Australian Space Agency and, and a company called Skycraft. Uh, we're doing a number of parts for the space for space application. The technology that we have with Xclave is actually very well adapted to this. Um, actionable intelligence and robots. Uh, we have um, designed a, a particular um, uh, a particular uh, payload to sort of detect a number of a number of uh, threats, typically in the uh, chemical, biological, and um, and um, uh, threats or, or, or radiological uh, threats that you can get. That can be fitted on this little small robot, but it can be um, fitted to um, you know any any uh, anything to sort of detect and locate um, the uh, those kinds of threats you know from from afar. So you don't expose the uh, the people that are you know trying to sort of deal with you know a particular chemical or a risk that you don't know. You you send a small robot, check it out, and then and then act accordingly. So very successful as well on that. Coming to the, uh, the highlights, um, the half year that uh, you can see shown here uh, shows a uh, revenue that has gone, gone up you know, quite substantially from, uh, from last year for the first half. First half normally is a weak time for us. Um, it's a, uh, this year has been reasonably, reasonably good. Uh, the gross profit has increased as well. So uh, we went from 8 million to 16 million revenue and the gross profit from um, 1.8 to about 3 million uh, for the first half. What, what we're doing is really changing the business. And I think that is shown in, this, in that particular, uh, particular slide. Uh, FY19 revenue, most of it was, we did about $37 million turnover. Uh, we mainly, mainly had low revenue, uh, low sort of margin revenue, mainly of distribution of existing products. Um, mainly in, in the drone business, we have a big contract with the, the Australian Defense on, on drones. And we had a, a limited uh, amount and share of our own products and, and support services that are mainly high, high, high margin. This year is going to change, start changing quite substantially. Um, the uh, UAV is still very, uh, very large, but we have more and more of our own ballistic products and proprietary products. Um, the consolidation of our activity in the US is actually contributing to this. The fact that we have actually signed a, uh, a repair contract for um, all the drones that we have in, um, in, in Australia is also, you know, increasing substantially our maintenance activity, which is a high margin activity. And as you can see, the long term mix is going to sort of uh, go towards more ballistic products that we, we have through the x and, and the US, a lot of support services and a lot less of the other products that are less profitable. 
So we've been, you know, marginally uh, profitable for the last uh, three years, which is always better than uh, than lose money when, especially when you develop so many technologies that are so so attractive. It needs a fair bit of investment, but you can see that uh, that will convert into uh, into larger profit in in you know from next year basically. So. Outlook, um, we are very well positioned to execute that uh, operational strategy and capitalize on further growth opportunity. Um, the key catalysts are commencing export uh, of Exclave manufactured product into the US and Europe, um, achieve further commercial orders of Exclave products, achieve commercial orders for Exatlas technology, this is the software for the drones, and achieve ad additional SUS sales and maintenance revenue. So that's, that's the way we, uh, uh, we see the future and we work to, towards that future. Uh, that concludes my, uh, my presentation um, with the usual disclaimer uh, being a, uh, um, a listed company. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, um, if you have uh, questions for this uh, very exciting opportunity, please, um, um, I'm open to answering that. Thank you very much, uh, Philippe. There's a, one or two questions coming in, but I'm while people are still typing there, I might just jump in with two of my own. Um, in terms of the US acquisition, are those guys that uh, you've bought, are they going to be marketing all of the proprietary products or is it just the, the armor plates and helmets? Well, the company is making armor plates and helmets. So you know they, they, that that's their job. That's their their their, their raison d'être, if I can call it that. So that, that's what they do. So they com they they are continuing with their own uh, range of products, which tend to be uh, a bit less advanced. Uh, well, remember we're the most advanced anyway, so <laughs> they're a bit less advanced. But they they sell at that good good prices. They have a very very strong presence, particularly in the law enforcement area. And remember that in the U.S. you have eighteen thousand law enforcement agencies, I'm talking agencies, not people, you have 800,000 officers, but 18,000 different uh, uh, organisms that are buying. Um, and so you need a, a, a very extensive network of distributors and, uh, uh, and, and ways to contact these, these 18,000. And these guys are, are really pretty much up there. So uh, introducing a new product for them uh, is not very difficult. They have all the contacts, they have all the distributors, the distributors are now primed and they're very, very enthusiastic about the, uh, about the product. So, um, you know, they, they, they are a, uh, not only a manufacturer, which is important, there they are lots of distributors in the US, but very few manufacturers. Uh, they will, in the longer term, produce uh, our products as well with our Exclave. We'll, we'll install an Exclave there when the time comes, uh, which give them access to, uh, to the military in particular, where uh, you need to produce in the US. But uh, they are, you know, absolutely uh, uh, very important to make sure that uh, we, we access the U.S. market and they have all the commercialization means that uh, if we had to do it ourselves, would have taken years. Okay. Um, actually, you must have uh, read the mind of the, of, the, of the two questions we've got in. Um, they're both basically around um, the manufacturing. So what you've slightly alluded to it in, to my answers, uh, we've one question on timing of when an XLAB machine will be installed in the US. Uh, and then the second question is, you know, could you do all manufacturing from Australia or, you know, will you require in, let's say, a region, you know, one the US, one Europe in terms of um, XLAB machines and manufacturing facilities globally? Well, the, uh... The first part of the answer to that is the fact that uh, uh, we have a capacity in that um, um, in that machine to do up to about forty million dollars of revenue, whether you're talking plates or, or helmets. Uh, you do less helmets, but they're, they're more valuable. So, you know, group, roughly speaking, you can do about forty million dollars of revenue. So, we we'll try not to have too many machines across the world uh, when one is actually fully fully utilized. Uh, so it, the, the, the timing of other machines is going to be dependent on, on the, 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 the uh, speed of the success, not whether we'll have success, we will, but the speed of it. Uh, the next one is obviously going to go to the US uh, because they have uh, requirements for, for local manufacturing. Uh, we have a factory already there making you know, armor. Uh, so making, putting a machine there, we, we expect something like about 18 months uh, from now. 
um, again, depending on, on the, the use of the, the, uh, the Australian machine. Um, other countries, well, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Uh, we've been successful in Finland for things uh, exported out of Australia. Um, there are some um, custom duties, but they're not very high. Um, but people still like to, uh, to do things uh, in, 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 uh, in Europe, um, um, out of Europe. Um, so it's probably going to be, you know, the third uh, possibility that we look at uh, in what format, I'm not sure. But, uh, you know, uh, by then we'll have two machines working, $80 million revenue, you know, it should be, uh, the uh, uh, life uh, would look pretty good. Yeah. Um, and then another question on the, uh, on the machines. Um, if you were to install a second one, you know, what kind of cost is it to actually commission one of these um, at another location? Uh, it's not exactly a cheap, a cheap investment. Um, we're talking several, several million dollars between the machine itself and, and the associated machinery that uh, allows it to sort of be, um, uh, be efficient um, and what we call preforming um, uh, tools and, and machines. But yeah, several million dollars. So you, you need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, you have a market and that uh, it can be used uh, before you, you sort of do this. But compared to, you know, compared to what you can make out of it, which is, you know, 40 million a year, the, the investment, even if it's, uh, you know, four, four to five million dollars is not, not exactly a, uh, a, um, uh, an affordable. Yeah. And it's then actually the, more. And then the last question, just before we run out of time, um, what is uh, the latest space development products and potential in that, let's say, division? Um, well, we started a bit with, with the idea that um, um, because we can make extremely light uh, composite in general, and, and in, in that case, carbon fiber, you know, what we use in helmets is not carbon fiber, it's a, it's a specific fiber that uh, absorbs um, a, uh, a lot of kinetic energy. But for carbon fiber that is extremely stiff and and, uh, and very light, uh, we can actually reduce the weight again. You know, we can have less um, uh, less uh, resin, which is uh, what uh, uh, brings the, the fiber together. And um, and with very high pressure, it actually works. Will work very well in in, in space. So we, we thought it was a uh, a good idea, but it actually picked up you know extremely quickly. We, we signed um, <clears throat> about a year ago a, um, an MOU with uh, the Australian Space Agency. Uh, we've done some work of development of uh, frames for a, um, for a small satellite with uh, um, um, Skycraft, um, a company based in, uh, in Canberra. And so we're looking at uh, different ways to sort of uh, uh, get that uh, up, up and running uh, on, on the small satellites and small launches that are really uh, what makes the uh, the industry so so attractive, from very expensive, very large um, um, uh, launches and satellite, the world is going towards much smaller, much more affordable, and uh, and large series sort of um, uh, satellites. And and weight is is everything in, in on a satellite. So um, we we hope to have some very good news in the very very short future, uh, in terms of uh, actual applications of that particular technology in space. Philippe, unfortunately, we'll have to leave it there um, so I can move on to the next presenter. Uh, Philippe, thank you very much for your time. If you can just stop sharing your screen now and then we can um, get our next presenter in. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. And, um, you know, I uh, hope I'll, uh, we'll see you soon on, your, uh, on our share register. Have a, have a very good day. Thank you. Thanks, Philippe. Just going to let me introduce now uh, Mark Samlal, the Managing Director of Pay Group. Great, thank you. Good morning, Mark, and good morning to all the participants of the webinar. Um, we are a March 31 year balancing, so uh, since we had our results presentation on the ASX um, <clears throat> last Friday, I thought I'd use that presentation deck for all of the investors on today's call. Um, so Pay Group uh, is a leading provider of SaaS solutions and service solutions in payroll and HCM across 33 clients, 33 countries in Asia, Asia and the Middle East. We operate predominantly from our two headquarters um, 
one being in <clears throat> Flinders Lane in Melbourne and the other one in, in Singapore for our two business units. We listed two years ago um, and have had uh, excellent growth over our last two years. And one of the great drivers for revenue for our business is payslip to process per annum. So at IPO, we, we listed at 400,000 per annum. We've had growth as a result of organic and acquisitions now be doing 4.7 million payslips um, per annum. So a terrific growth there. We've also um, <clears throat> launched our IPO with 17 countries that we provide service in and through our um, own reach and certainly with some partnerships, we're now in 33 countries. So the broader our reach, the more pay slips we do, the more opportunity we give to our customers to, to use us, ourselves for more services. Uh, very importantly, when a procurement uh, process is undertaken by our customer base or future customer base, typically multinationals, all the names that you would expect us to service, they would look to authoritative guides. And we have been in the Gartner Guide for multi-country payroll, SAS and HCM solutions for the last two years. As a result of our IPO, we were awoken to Gartner. So we're very proud of the fact that we sit in that guide along with other billion dollar companies. And importantly, what pay groups achieved um, for our businesses is a global partner program. So UK organisations, US organisations that are world leaders in this space, we don't have a operation or a setup uh, within Asia for their customers, utilise our services at our normal rate card uh, so that we can provide uh, payroll SaaS or payroll and HCM outsourcing services to their client base. So essentially we're getting a very economic sales organisation for our own solution set, which augments our um, organic growth. Those partners are all deeply integrated. So there is a deep integration level from our platform to theirs. Really, with this really steps up what we uh, achieved in terms of our, our timelines of a company and what we've done post IPO in our acquisitions and growth of particular service lines in particularly our treasury services, which I'll discuss a little bit later on in the presentation. So our FY20 highlights were, um, were terrific. And importantly, we set out as a board to give guidance to the market for FY20 of 17.5. We exceeded our revenue guidance for ARR to 17.8. Pro forma impact of 3.9 million. And importantly, a terrific turnaround in cash um, for the fiscal. And we continue very strong focus on profitable sales, a global partnership program, treasury servicing, uh, treasury services continuing throughout our group and, uh, and a very big focus on, uh, on cash. The acquisition of Astute um, was a great contributor to our group. And we'll talk through the highlights of that acquisition a little bit later on with 8.8 .8 million of ARR. As we've finished our financial year, March 31, and we are two months into this year, obviously, one of the key metrics for investors to look at for pay group is to have a look at what we call an implementation backlog, but actually it's visibility into what revenue looks like for FY21 in terms of the um, unique uh, events for our billing, pay slips in our SaaS business, in our treasury business, and also in our services business, whereby we have sold those last year and they're yet to be implemented and are staged into implementation into this year. So in addition, we have 12,068 unique billing events yet to um, implement and hence yet to build. So that's a ter terrific positive indicator. We've grown dramatically with organic. We've also grown dramatically from inorganic. However, the focus of management has always been on service and ensuring our service levels. And that's why we're very proud of our 95% customer retention rate. And for those of you that knew us at IPO, um, that's been an ongoing theme of retention for quite a few years now. And we're very proud of the fact that our customers come to us and then grow with us as they expand in the region. 
when we, we listed, uh, core feedback from our existing shareholders was obviously what is your inorganic, what is your acquisition strategy? So our first significant acquisition was the business Astute One. And Astute services the very high growth contractor and temporary work, workforce market in Australia and just recently in New Zealand. Um, we're very proud of the acquisition and, 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 this, and assure our shareholders that at the time of acquisition, it was a great deal. It's proved to be better because of their performance, where they've uh, exceeded their FY24 cast from the time of acquisition. It's profitable, it's cash flow generative, and it gives great cross-selling opportunities for pay group in general. Importantly, it significantly increased our SaaS revenues and um, complementary modules for our customers. And as a result of having uh, an increased user base on uh, Amazon Web Services, we've been able to identify further efficiencies across the group, um, particularly around uh, usage of, of Amazon and Azure. So it's had a great track record of sustainable growth. Again, founder-led company, 100% share swap to come into pay group. Founders, uh, all staff, all customers, everything have retained and moved into the pay group operating area. And this was uh, done at 85 cents a share, which is a significant premium then to, to the market. So a great acquisition for pay group. Uh, our segment performance really talks about uh, the way each of our different business units have been operating. Starting from the right-hand side, Treasury obviously has a very high uh, bar graph as a result of a low start, but uh, it, it is a very fast moving element of our business where either our payroll and human capital management customers use us for treasury services, which is the last mile of moving their payroll funds into the different jurisdictions around the world, and an increasing growing amount of non-payroll clients uh, are also doing this as they struggle to understand the complexities of banking and assuring that their employees' salaries and statutory benefits are paid in up to 33 countries across uh, Asia and the Middle East. So quite, quite some growth there. Astute, the business in the middle, is our SaaS platform for workforce management companies and corporates to manage their comp contractor and uh, temporary worker pools. And on the left-hand side, PayAsia, the first business that uh, Pay Group listed. And you can see all of them have had um, positive uh, implementations to be, to be done for FY21. So a great start for us in a uh, COVID-impacted year. I'll move away from the pro forma adjustments. The, the presentation will be online. In the interest of time, I'll talk to you further about the investable ideas and the thematics for pay group. So from a strategy and outlook perspective, um, we're very focused on assuring our clients and our prospects that we are here for them with the adoption of cloud-based software. There is a massive shift to online and remote workplaces, obviously. So as a result of that, organisations across the region have an inability to process manual claims, leave, medical, paper-based things. The uptake of our SaaS solutions across our client base has been very, very positive to the start of FY21 as a result of COVID. We're seeing offices shut. They're adopting our online um, workflow processes across the, across the group. There is an increased usage and reliances on our software and services. Now, the reason that, that has happened and why our sales funnel and our sales have increased in, in FY21 is that there has never been a stronger time ever that there's a spotlight on payroll and HR companies as all of the stimulus packages as all of the changes in legislation for payroll and human, human capital management has changed over the last six months. There has never been a stronger spotlight. What that's actually done is shown in greater depth in the region and also in Australia, that there is a distinct underinvestment in technology and a distinct underinvestment in talent and how talent is managed in these critical areas. 
So full outsourcing solutions have become very much uh, heightened in terms of the uh, buyers of our solutions to implement. And also, particularly in Australia, in workforce management companies, where government stimulus packages are increasing the capabilities, we are deploying more SaaS into workforce management companies, government training organisations and apprenticeship boards to manage the stimulus packages that didn't have effective solutions before. So there is a very much heightened awareness around risks of underpayment of employees in this marketplace, as well as overpayments. And that was something that we were seeing a lot in Australia in 2019 and 2000. Uh, and 20 early parts, but that's overtaken by the stimulus packages. That will continue to happen if organisations don't use technology that is built for the region from the region. And our astute platform developed from 2006 is 100% developed and managed for Australia and New Zealand environments. The focus on data security and privacy never stops. There is a massive amount of data privacy acts being enacted. So as a result of that, we comply to all of them and we operate under an ISO situation, both for privacy and processing uh, of data around the globe, including working with um, our European and, and US partners. We'll continue to focus on um, strategic partnerships and acquisitions. These partnerships can assist pay group in monetizing our clients' employees. So we'll come up with um, areas such as accessing wages earned, come up with areas of pay payroll insurance, and these are all future things for us to add to our distribution base um, because of 875 clients across the region. We've got a great opportunity to be able to bring new products, new technologies through partnerships and developments ourselves. We're seeing a very strong movement in the past six months of what we call lift and shift. So you may have a technology that you use in Australia to do your processing. And in order for you to remain competitive, smart shoring or offshoring of, that, of those people and that technology is, is now very much in focus. So we'll see a continuance of organisations wanting to lift and shift their business, and we're perfectly uh, attuned and adaptable to be able to do those and to then to harmonise it with our technology sets and our service offering through our multiple um, service centres in Asia, but definitely Philippines, Malaysia and, and India. Cross-sells and upsells opportunities remain very focused, which I talked about the significant structural tailwind of the movement to online workflow solutions. The increase of payroll and demands across um, Asia Pacific, particularly Australia and definitely New Zealand, have seen an increasing level of complexity, both at the pay element, the HR transaction, leave, claims, medical claims, expense management, and to do that all effectively online. And importantly, the movement of payroll funds throughout those different jurisdictions. We've always entertained technology built in Asia and Australia for Australia and New Zealand to be effective. We deploy in three, up to three months. And all of our contracts that we sign are three year repetitive revenue contracts. With a 95% retention rate, that gives a very, very level of high level of comfort for you to have visibility into our business and the way that we operate. They are three year repetitive revenue contracts with a, a price per employee per pay slip. Philippines has two pay slips per month. Australia sometimes still has four. So we're getting this incremental repetitive revenue uh, every single payroll processing period. When we talk about the market, we're really talking how um, uh, Gartner addresses the market to be a, from the services perspective, a $26.2 billion US market size. And from an HCM perspective, we're talking 1.9 billion from, a, from US dollars. The, again, the Gartner relevant study. But what I'd like to point everybody to today, please, is on the right-hand side in the last bullet point. 
many organisations uh, <clears throat> up until 2019 were undertaking massive global um, uh, implementations or re-implementations of solutions and services. As a result of COVID and looking at um, the way that they spend their cash today, many global projects have been put onto shelves and what the heightened focus is now in our sales funnel is regional ones. So as workforce patterns change from Europe and the US and come to Asia, as work from home continues to be very much prevalent as we move forward, we are seeing a greater number of multinational organisations that want to focus on regional deals as opposed to their large scale global ones, where we can implement and effect a solution for them in weeks, maybe months versus years. Our partnership program for the astute business or the pay Asia business that we operate in allows for very interesting leading global organizations to utilize their sales force to bring leads to us, such as ultimate software in the US bringing leads to us um, for Asia or cloud pay in the UK who actually use our rate card, sign our SUS solutions and SaaS technologies into their offering where we get 37 salespeople from them assisting us with our, with our growth. So we're now up to 10% of our pay slips that we generate in the pay Asia business as a result of the global, global partnership program, which really only started about 20 months ago. Now, with that in mind, each one of these partners are deeply integrated between our own proprietary platforms and theirs. So it's a very attractive financial position and certainly we're accelerating growth with that low customer acquisition cost with thin account management responsibilities. So as I mentioned earlier, um, about 10% of our software with a service um, and treasury payslips comes from our, the GPP. We have seven partners and we have a new exclusive agreement with an Australian partner who have a hundred of their own clients here in Australia that will look to shift their entire client-based operations implementation to us. Therefore, they will be able to scale way beyond that they uh, can uh, with very light investment and essentially become the account management and sales organization while we look after their implementations and operations. It's a perfect balance. And that is a great example of a, of a lift and shift. We've got pre-identified cost efficiencies that we know, 1.5 on an annualized basis, and we will work our way through these and implement them over the course um, of FY21 and beyond. So very great summary from FY20. Um, new sales were 5.5 total contract value for that period. Remembering they are three-year contracts, all repetitive revenue. There is very little one-time revenue in our business. Our global, global partnership program, which we've invested in from integration and people, is very attractive margins and revenue streams. We have positive operating cash flow from H2 FY20. Um, we gave that uh, guidance to the market and that focus will continue for, FY, uh, for definitely for FY21. From an outlook perspective, uh, I would like to let everybody on the call know today, we did 5.5 million in TCV for the full year last year. For April and May this year, we have signed $2.7 million of TCV, nearly 50% 50, 50 of all of last year in the first two months. This is a COVID-19 tailwind. We are seeing a heightened focus on outsourcing and improving your technology in remote workforces and as organisations shift more workforce into Asia. We will see a bounce back in contractors and temporary workers in Australia and New Zealand. We've seen it already in New Zealand, they're back to work. So it's an excellent time for our astute organisation and the platform for um, payroll and billing that they provide to, to their customers. I won't walk you through the COVID-19 update, but just to let you know some of our customers that we have, 
um, are certainly extremely diversified. Basically, no direct um, uh, customers in travel and hospitality, uh, but certainly all of the organisations that you expect to be very strong in, in, in these years and continue their investments in, um, in Asia. A set of our module suites, which you'll see on um, <coughs> Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel, should you look at it later on, or on the ASX, <coughs> governed by an excellent board. Mark, I might uh, pause there and take questions, should there be any. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions. Um, I'm just going to um, take one stuff or submit it ahead of time, actually, via email. Um, I think this is actually, uh, you might go back to your uh, segment, revenue segment split slide, uh, might be uh, instructive. Um, are contracts fully variable in nature, i.e. is your revenue linked to the number of pay slips processed or the amount paid or, you know, what is the fixed portion, I guess, in terms of um, pay slips? Um, every contract has a floor. So there is a minimum fee to every contract. And then, yes, each contract um, <clears throat> has modules attributed to it. So it's a per employee per month, or per, beg your pardon, per employee per pay slip, um, depending upon the modules they use and the service levels they use. So the variability is in the amount of countries they deploy, the amount of um, uh, pay, people they employ and certainly the amount of modules they use okay and then this other question that was submitted ahead of time is a percentage of revenue from countries and industry uh, particularly the split between government and private um, and then the impact on operating cash flow from March April um, COVID-19 but I think you pretty much covered that part yeah. of the question the um, operating cash I'll t take the second part first um, in Asia, we operate under a situation where um, many of our significant countries have what's called a 13-month bonus or a extra payslip. So <clears throat> we get two billing events in the, in the last, um, last month. So you'll see that cash flow coming through into Q1 FY21. So that helps very much the case. We've um, had extraordinary sales growth um, in Q4 and also Q1. Uh, we will see that continue. We've got smallish exposure to government, um, in, certainly in Asia, but uh, in Australia, where we work with government-related organisations, particularly in apprenticeship boards, that's where a lot of stimulus is going. So we're seeing the numbers increase there. We have no client concentration. Our largest client is 3% 3, 3 of the group. And um, the concentration of countries is Australia, Singapore, India, Malaysia, Philippines, is, which you would expect because they're all big populations for multinational workforces. Uh, and just sticking on revenue, I'm just um, feeling questions now from the, the live audience. How do you charge for the treasury services? The Treasury services are a um, fee per pay slip. So if it's two pay slips per month, then we get two fees. And that's realistically to do the last mile lodgement of all the various statutory body payments required, as well as the payroll in itself. So we have restricted funds in our, in our company. Customers move their payroll funds into our client accounts and it's really managing the payments of all of the various statutory bodies into the uh, employees' bank accounts um, into the various jurisdictions. So extremely complex, particularly for multinationals that don't want that type of banking exposure. And then have you got any risk or exposure to errors in calculations of payrolls? Um, they're talking about here, you know, large underpayments of payroll that have, you know, been exposed, you know, it comes up from time to time of, um, you know, large companies underpaying uh, employees. Very good question. Um, in Australia and New Zealand, where that's extremely prevalent, we're seeing a lot of deployment of, uh, of technologies that are very old. Um, but more importantly, um, under... Uh, under under, under uh, education on, on payroll and HR teams. So that's point number one. We spend uh, a significant amount of educating our teams. 
uh, on legislations across, across the uh, region. For Australia and New Zealand, the Astute platform works with workforce management companies such as you've seen there, um, Kelly, Michael Page, um, AgriLabor. This is a technology that has been built from the ground up to manage complex enterprise bargaining agreement, awards, time sheeting, and the various other inputs to make a, 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 a paycheck live. So we're very comfortable in our client base that the SaaS technology hasn't experienced that at, at, at any level that we've, we've seen in our Australian and New Zealand clients. For our services business and also in Asia, uh, a customer signs off every process as accurate before the payment files are created and we make the payments on behalf of them. So it's the customer's responsibility. Um, we, we're very comfortable with our success rate and our accuracy rate. And then uh, another one in terms of revenue, but I guess it's asking it in a different way. Um, can you advise what your annual revenue per customer growth is? Um, so, in, so in other words, if you've got a customer, you're doing 100 employees, um, what's the, the revenue growth there in terms of price uplift, you know, cross-selling of additional products? I think that's what they're, the, the questioner is alluding to. It's very much dependent upon the customer. So um, <clears throat> if you use a, an organisation such as Westpac, they arrive in Singapore with one country and as they invest into their high growth areas, and you'll see all of these companies saying, we want to expand in Asia, we want a bigger um, slice of the Asian market, they'll win a banking licence in Indonesia, in India, in the Philippines, and we just expand with them. If we look at Appen, that's a very good example, and everybody loves hearing about Appen. Um, they, they spent a lot of money on a um, development centre to uh, attract um, freelance workers for their technology in the Philippines. We win that business, and then we do such a great job, including interfaces to all their systems, that they then give us Australia, then they give us Singapore, that, and we actually help them as they go to enter in, into a new market with employment costs. So we're deeply ingrained, highly trusted, and give analysis ahead of time. So growth by customer um, really depends upon their investment into the region. Uh, DuPont, um, were spun off three companies. As a result of that, we got three new com customers. Terminos, a Swiss listed banking technology company, have bought five businesses in Australia. So we win five different customers. So this, it's a, quite a variable mix depending upon the company's decided investment of the region. Um, I think we've pretty much covered them all and it's perfect timing because we're at the, the top of the hour and I'm conscious that uh, the opening match is starting so I want to let people get back to their desks and their screens. Mark, thank you very much for the presentation. Thanks everyone for joining. The next meeting will be happening again in two weeks' time and I'll be announcing the presenters for that in due course. Um, and yeah, I'll wish everybody a good day. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark.